thank you to the president, President Pittman. Thank you, Jarrell and Kevin. And to all those who make this possible, the Jacksons, all the Jacksons. <laughs> it's a gift and a joy to be here with you today. I presented this morning in the Tabernacle Center about my research that I've been doing over this last year due to the Reflective Leadership Grant. And I will share a little bit, some of you were able to hear that, and I'll share a little bit more about that um, in this sermon. But since the January 2019, I've been giving a considerable amount of time to conducting ethnography with black clergy women. I've traveled throughout the United States to witness the work and the ministry of women who are flourishing in their vocation. I'm grateful to the Duke Leadership family, to Phillips Seminary for your institutional support and endorsement, and to my husband who has given me an incredible amount of support during regular travel that marked our first year of marriage. I started this work with the hope that it might lead me to have a better understanding of what has contributed to the flourishing of black clergy women with the hope that I would be a part of their spiritual formation and pastoral cultivation in ways that would help them to feel more prepared in ways that I didn't and some of my colleagues also experienced. And during this time, I learned an extraordinary amount about their lives, and I'd say I got more than what I planned for. I came to see more clearly the similarities among black clergy women about our experiences and unique journeys. I listened to accounts from clergy women filled with candor, courage, and holy wisdom. I was moved by their experiences and our experiences that seemed to tether us to a heritage that existed in our intersections of our race, gender, ancestry, and vocation. And in today's text in Mark, actually in the text prior, in the antecedent text, Jesus has commissioned his disciples. He has given them authority and instructions to do good works, to do works of liberation and of justice. And they have just buried John the Baptist. And where we find them today is they are telling Jesus about their commitment to this work. That they are doing what Jesus has commissioned them to do. They have casted out demons, anointed the sick, healed and taught the people. And Jesus knows that there is more work to do. That there is more work that is coming. More people are coming. More hearts are broken. More bodies that are ill. And more miracles in need of miracle workers. So Jesus tells the disciple, disciples that along with their divine work comes a need for them to tend to their humanity, to tend to their souls. And he said, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. While conducting this research study and listening to numerous narratives, it became clear that the demands of the jobs of black women led to much neglect of themselves and their families. That the systems we often have, specifically in the black church, many of those systems we've inherited are broken. The churches that many of us have been a part of have inherited ineffectual practices, and we lack the time to imagine new and effective methods that will go against devaluing ourselves and disregarding our presence and gifts. While each black clergywoman that I interviewed illustrated excellence in trailblazing, pastoral care, preaching, and even deconstructing evil systems and practices, I was awakened to how many black clergywomen shared about their work in ways that paralleled the lives of black people on southern plantations during the era of US slavery. I listened to narratives of women who worked hard to go against the adopted antebellum plantation hierarchy and practices through choosing ones that were conducive to their wholeness. 
This system, this plantation system, the plantocracy, that has a ruling elite, at that time it was the planter class, those in charge of managing the plantation, a well-crafted pyramid scheme where the ones on the bottom were doing all the work and the ones on the top were merely taking credit for it at the abuse of the ones on the bottom. And so I'm sure many of you are like, okay, Alexis, I get this is about your research, but what does this have to do with us? Good question. My work centers the voices and the work of black clergy women. Many of them have been decentered, and that's part of the detrimental effects that have happened in their bodies and in their lives. 400 years removed from the beginning and only 155 or so years removed from its abolishing, American chattel slavery has had detrimental and long-term effects on all of us within this country. Innumerable words have been said and written about the predatory practices of plantations, yet we have fully to see their damaging effects upon our institutions, our churches, and how they are built upon many of the same principles. The plantation system was a sick system, and it has contaminated all of us. Those who attended this morning session wondered how this work that centers black women applies to them. And that, in this sermon, I will highlight how the antebellum plantation system affects and infects each of us. And though the effects may show up differently in each of our lives, we are all affected, and we all have experiences that illustrate a sick system in need of a just Jesus. And the first way I want to highlight is that we buy into the system's ethic of work. We buy into the system's ethic of work. Mark 6.30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. The disciples who were busy living out their job descriptions detailed what they did, fulfilled their roles, and how they worked well and how they thrived. And they were doing good work, works of reconciliation, works of justice. The problem was not the work that they were doing, but their inability to break from the work. Their inability not to be defined by the very work that they were doing. Many of us have learned how to live in that kind of plantation system. Even if we don't like it, we have been inculcated and brainwashed to believe that this kind of system can work for us. A system whose work ethic is toxic. The system that has taught us how to grind work long and late to accomplish our task, to earn our pay, to expand our credentials, and to ascend life's ladders. And we know how to measure other people by their ability to do the very same. During one of my first interviews, I shared about my work, proud of how much I have accomplished in my work in pastoral ministry, programs started, sermons preached, good work done, acknowledged that there were things I could have done better, I had some poor boundaries, but I worked hard. You can say a lot of things, but I worked hard. And as I tell the interviewee a little, a little bit about that to help her understand where I'm coming from, she stopped me and she said this, words, that have haunted me and I will never forget. The Reverend Dr. Renita J. Weems said, huh, having to prove yourself in a system in which you already had many strikes against you, huh? There's no proving in that. There was nothing you were going to prove. You did a great job, but you didn't prove anything to, that you were going to be equal to anybody. You were never going to be equal to them. You were going to prove something, but it's not that you were equal. You were going to prove that you could be a good slave. You make a great slave, but that doesn't mean you make a great slave master. You just make a great slave. Mark 6.30 says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. We are exhausted. 
Many of us don't even like the work that we used to love. We may still love the people, but we may resent certain, sign, certain assignments in the calling. We can become miserable. We keep pressing forward in the Lord's work, but sometimes we're just stumbling towards burnout. We don't use vacation days because we feel guilty. And if we do, we try to make up the extra work on another end. We take sabbaticals only to produce projects that we don't have time to do in our regular schedules. We convince ourselves that too much play makes us irresponsible, unworthy of promotion, and worse of anything, un-American. We have a just Jesus and a sick system. Jesus knew that the crowds would be endless, but that there must be time to stop. Jesus knows, even if your colleagues and congregants don't, that the emails in your inbox are endless, that the preparations for upcoming programs are pulling on you, and that at the end of Remind and Renew, there are congregants waiting to send, them, to send you their request. And I hope that sometime in these next two days, after hearing dynamic teaching, engaging with old friends and colleagues, sharing meals with good companions, that you'll find some time to come away and rest. That you'll take time to sit, to enjoy things that don't have to just do with your work, to have conversations that aren't about your congregations or what you're writing. Take some time to come away and rest, and your work and your worship will be better for it. The second way that we illustrate a sick system in need of a just Jesus is that we lack an ethic of rest. So not only do we buy into the system's ethic of work, we lack an ethic of rest. Jesus said, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. What I found out in my research that a roadblock to justice in a plantation society is a lack of rest. There is just too much to do. Rest, Sabbath, vacation, sabbatical. Like the apostles, we learn that throughout the Gospels that there is so much work to be done that it's easy to resist rest. Instead of realizing that our rest can be a form of resistance, we just keep going and producing more. Perhaps even the disciples thought, Jesus is unaware of all of these people who need our attention. Perhaps they thought Jesus was just a little antisocial, that he couldn't take time to understand one that maybe he had poor naivete, poor um, time management and naivete, that he didn't understand that these people needed him. Going away to rest was not realistic. And some of you have children with schedules that are just as full as yours. Others are caregivers that you don't get to clock out at the end of the day. And some of you just want to use your marginal time to catch up with the people you love about the happenings of your life. The people who help you to feel heard and valued. And yet the reality is that we all have real impositions on our time. It's difficult to come away to a secluded place. Most of us don't even have those. Away from writing, reading, teaching, news updates, eye count and out, outlook demands, most of us are just inundated with the demands on our times. And I tell you that the lies of the plantocracy tell us that less rest means more production. And that less rest allows us to meet the needs of people, and that's the best way to love our neighbors as ourselves. But this is not so. It's really hard to love our neighbors well when we treat ourselves like poorly. Poorly. Like during slavery, the harder we work, the more we produce, the more our picking rates increase. You know what I mean, last year we did that and it was great, but in 2020 we have to do it better. In 2018, this many people attended, so in 2020, this many people attended. More lights, more flash, more demands. 
Rest is not a priority in the plantation system. We have to break from it or it will break us. Rest says to the powers that be that I will not be caught up in trying to save everyone around me at the expense of destroying myself. Rest shows the powers that be that we will not be driven by capitalistic crisis, but by a Christological call to rest. Yes, yes, the harvest is indeed plentiful and the laborers are few. And so we should pray to the Lord of the harvest for more laborers and not submit ourselves to be slaves in this system. 80% of the women that I interviewed entered forced periods of rest. They're buying into the ethic of plantation work brought on various illnesses, autoimmune diseases, and manifestations of stress in their bodies. When they failed to take a break from the work, the work ended up breaking them. It was in coming away, returning to the one who called them, returning to the one whose yoke is still easy and burden is light, that they found rest, that they found restoration. When we fail to allow our minds and our bodies and souls to bear witness to a just Jesus, they will always succumb to a sick system. And the final characteristic I want to highlight of the plantation system that needs dismantling is an ethic of leisure as luxury. The ethic of leisure as luxury. Verse 31, for many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. They had no leisure even to eat. For a few years, I was a site director at a summer camp here in Tulsa And we welcomed elementary age children, and our focus was on improving literacy skills, building relationships with children in our community. And as the site director, I managed the day-to-day operations, put out fires, dealt with behavioral issues. But one of my favorite parts of my job was connecting with our college interns, students who were discerning vocation and giving their summers to care for those in our community who needed it most. One day, a staff member walked into my office, as I was busy, and said, Carter, I heard that you didn't let the interns have lunch. I look up from my Excel sheet. Yep, they haven't earned it. Some came unprepared with their lesson plans this morning. He looked dumbfounded. Carter, I couldn't work for you. Nope, well, if you want to eat, then you got to work. Eating is a privilege on my staff. I operated like that for years. Those who worked under my leadership did not take lunch breaks unless their work ethic showed that they earned it. There was no rest, no leisure, no time for table, fellowship, unless production was high. Because if production was high, then they deserved leisure. But if production wasn't high, that means they had already been taking leisure and they didn't need any more of it. It was for the good of the children in our community. So there was no time to eat. It's a sick system. But thank God there's a just Jesus. And the section of scripture that we're at, it's, a, it's um, sandwiched between ministry and mission. And this pericope shows that the disciples are actually on their way to feed. What we know is the feeding of the 5,000. They are on their way to feed multitudes, yet they have not fed themselves. Can you imagine feeding the multitudes? and you haven't taken time to eat? Maybe that's some of us. Exhausted, on the verge of our next health crisis, on the verge of passing out, yet we're bragging about how much we did on our to-do list and how well we're excelling in the plantocracy, and it's destroying us. We spent the weekend writing sermons, preaching Sunday morning, dealt with comments, criticisms, and critiques at the doors of the church. And yet, sometimes, at the end of the day, there is no leisure. And one of the most spiritual, worshipful acts that we can do of justice is sometimes 
to push away the crowds and the emails and the text messages, to stop and to come away to a secluded place, to make time for leisure, to make time to eat, and to be with those who see us and who value us. And we live in a culture where we don't even have leisure. We don't support leisure. Who has time to read if it has nothing to do with the next week's sermon or next week's test? Time off. We need something to show for it. Who has time off and nothing to show and nothing to be applauded for by our congregates and colleagues unless we return with something tangible? Time to watch something that makes us feel good and laugh that has nothing to do with the sermon illustration? Who has time for that? So one of the questions today is, what master is Jesus calling you away from so that you can rest? Jesus is hoping that you'll rest, that you'll stop running yourself ragged, hoping that we will break in and take time to listen to our hunger pains, to take time to do things that make our soul sing. Sadly, for some, leisure is indeed a luxury and not something that they get to do or experience in regular rhythms. But the just Jesus, in the midst of a sick system, is calling you and I to rest, to resist it, to eat, so that we do not get infected with what is going around. I have a suspicion that some of you have been bought and bossed by slaveholder-like systems, whose voices are driving you to work harder, faster, longer, and produce stuff that doesn't even align with what you initially set out to do. Like the women I interviewed, this is not necessarily even people we know. Sometimes it's previous pastors, previous presidents, dead photos hanging in your church somewhere, department heads, general ministers, superintendents, bylaws, or even a book of discipline. What voices are you letting call you away from rest? The Reverend Christian Peel, who served as the executive minister of institutional advancement at Riverside Church in New York City, said this, we can break systems for others, but we do not always know how to do so for ourselves. This, my friends, is many of us. We know quite a bit about Jesus and justice, and we know what it means for how we must care for all of creation, specifically other humans, but we fail to understand what it means for how we should treat ourselves, as if something should exist called self-justice. I came to see women in my research who had made mistakes, who had learned some hard lessons, yet they were committed to pursuing wholeness. They made changes in the ways that they worked and rested. And these brought forth greater miracles of flourishing, not just for them, but for their congregations and communities. Because their liberation was bound up with the people in their communities. Jesus said to them, and Jesus says to us, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. We each have some authority to push back, to resist the system by working differently, choosing rest and calling for a dismantling of a sick system whose structure affects each and every one of us. Justice in Jesus begins with you. It begins with you. A sense of self-justice that stops self-harm and negative self-talk, that you are undeserving of rest, that you are undeserving of leisure. And so let this be a reminder at Remind and Renew. It's okay to come away, to feed yourself. It's a sick system, but there is indeed a just Jesus. Amen.